Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. We are out on the launch pad again today, uh, this time with a uh, fully fueled, fully, well not fully crewed, but uh, this is the new uh, Artemis 5L, uh, which actually probably needs a better name. Uh, we have a crew of four of its uh, capacity of uh, six, and uh, we're going to go out to the moon. We've got some uh, work to do out at the Rosalina Memorial Station. Um, so we've got a uh, complement of uh, two scientists, John Oliver and Dmitry Semyon. Name I'm not going to pronounce. Valentina's at the stick today, and we have a rookie engineer, Laura Douglas, who's uh, bringing her trusty DeWalt up to uh, do some repair and retrofit up at uh, Rosalina Station, and hopefully get the facility operational again so that we can clean out what data is left there, and uh, hopefully uh, make a little expedition to scoop up some new data. Anyway, our relative inclination with the moon is down to uh, 0.25, so SAS is on, throttle is set to full, ignition sequence start. Of course, we are going up on the uh, DN6BX. Looks like all engines are spooled. Let's get these clamps off. Yeah, it starts out a little slow. Where are my Delta V numbers? Why did those not? Yeah, where did those go? 1.14. So we were probably at like 1.12 when we went to lift off. This does have a. Uh, a little bit more mass up top than the uh, Artemis 4. Which, uh, I don't know if did I mention it already, but yeah, we could uh, we could probably name this something else, seeing as how we've changed up uh, the top half of it enough. So if you have a good suggestion for something other than Artemis 5, please do leave it in the comments. I would love to hear it. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get this into orbit, and I will pick all of you up there. Well, the launch was a fairly standard affair, nothing absolutely uh, important or noteworthy going on here, so I'll just tuck this back down into the corner real quick and show you even more boring footage of uh, our rover crane uh, thing making its trek to pick up that uh, uh, Agena core. That's what I'm trying to think of. Uh, that survived the impact from the... Uh, the delivery unit, I guess, being the term we're looking for here, and the landing legs, and scooping it up, of course, it's all uh, very much sped up footage. But uh, I did just automate this entire drive, had MechJub uh, plot the waypoint for me, and then left the room to go do other things, uh, namely homework. But uh, it did go off without a hitch, so long as you keep that uh, speed uh, at a reasonable level, which MechDev actually does a fantastic job of doing for us, so uh, maybe one or two times it got airborne that I caught here in the uh, review footage, but uh, nothing too spectacular. So we were able to actually deploy the crane and its magnet, uh, pick up eventually uh, this core, and uh, tuck it in the bed of the truck, set our target back for... Uh, Rosalina Memorial Station. I, I won't misidentify it this time. And then uh, back to the automated drive home. Uh, meanwhile, our launch vehicle is doing exceptionally well, well into its gravity turn and coming up here on Booster Sup, as I did use this as an opportunity to grab some stock footage of the rover that I can use later, maybe for an outro sequence or clips of something. And there goes Booster Sep. They are away and clean. Uh, shortly after they would fire, we will jettison the launch escape systems. We are now in uh, abort to orbit mode. It might be hard to see on that uh, tiny little tiny screen, but uh, it is in fact gone. And uh, our little rover guy performing absolutely flawlessly despite having two busted wheels. Uh, it did not flip over uh, when we picked up our cargo, as I kind of thought it would in a low-gravity environment, but also with those landing legs and the ability to maybe knock it right side up, I figured we might have enough leverage there to flip it right side up if something did happen, but uh, it's making its approach to uh, Rosalina Station, so we'll uh, cut the footage back over to our launch uh, already in progress and actually coming up here on Miko in just a few brief seconds. Yep, starting to almost round out the orbit. I think we will be shutting down uh, 
just a little early, seeing how we got like a kilometer per second left in those tanks. But anyway, I'm going to turn you back over to old me for live coverage. All right, 224 by 147. We're going to go ahead and stage off our core stage. Insufficient avionics. Oh, well, that's new. How does this only support 200 some odd? Oh no. There's no core on the HG3 stage. How did this happen? Why? Oh, I think I moved it out of the way to accommodate the lander and then forgot to put them back. There should be two 150 ton core, uh, computer cores here. That means we can't activate RCS. Well, this is new and interesting. <laughs> Without RCS, we can't allege the engine. Hmm. This is very interesting. This is very interesting indeed. All right, well, I think what we can do is uh, get rid of two of these fairings. It's not going to save us nearly enough tonnage. I wonder, just smart ASS. If you turn on kill rotation, will it turn on RCS? It will not. All I need to do is turn on RCS. Dang, why didn't I arm it earlier? All right, let's plot this node out and see what we can't figure out. So while we're plotting out this node, which is a fairly standard affair, I guess I'll uh, fill you in on the plan. Uh, Artemis 3, 4, and 5, or whatever it is that we're going to call this, were always built for Mars. Um, we just use the moon as a, a testing ground for viability and uh, re-entry testing, really, cargo capacity testing, but it's always had, or at least the, the design intention was always to have the Delta V to return itself from Mars, possibly with something like a habitat or some kind of cargo attached to it. So we actually have a whole lot of fuel, and uh, the absolute benefit to using a singular fuel type on these kinds of missions is that uh, we can vent a lot of fuel, or all of the fuel, out of the lander and still have enough on board uh, our Artemis or whatever it is that we're going to call it to refuel said lander and put ourselves uh, on a return course from home uh, from orbit of the moon. Now this would not be the case if we also had to uh, capture in orbit around the moon. This is not the case here because we have this completely full B upper stage and two ignitions on this HG3. So just so long as we don't screw up our uh, translunar injection burn or fail the uh, ignition to capture around the moon, we should, in theory, have more than enough fuel on our service module to not only refuel the lander, but uh, keep enough on board itself to get us home again. So that was my thinking, and that's why I'm venting all of this uh, very useful fuel out into space in an attempt to get uh, avionics control back, because I forgot to uh, put the control cores on the B upper stage. Typical. So hopefully we won't have to repeat this method ever again, but... Uh, just a heads up on what the plan actually is. So we've got control, RCS is armed, and now here's old me to celebrate. Now a smart person probably would have emptied the uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen from this tank because now we're at like more than four kilometers per second of delta V on this HG3 stage instead of completely vacuuming out the lander, but I have confidence that we can refuel the lander from the Artemis once we are in orbit. Uh, that is the plan. Anyway, uh, we will lock this tank because that is our get home fuel for certain. Everything in here, I think we can transfer safely once we are in orbit of the moon. Uh, 53 minutes to go and 
till our burn. How's our electric charge? Are we keeping that topped off? Yep. There we go. That's good enough on the node. This, this works pretty well, actually. <laughs> None too shabby, I have to say. Although, uh, having those cores probably would have helped out a whole lot more. We certainly have the margins for it, and I know they were on the Artemis 3. I guess, yeah, they just, they got moved so I could put this lander on this fairing. I think they were clipping in and looking quite badly. Oh well. We'll figure it out. Uh, this says that burn will take a minute and 14 seconds. That really cannot be right. We are five minutes out from the burn. It says it'll take nine minutes to displace 4.2 kilometers per second. Actually, you know what? We're going to ride this in just a little bit more. Get us to about the four minute mark and then we'll light her up. All right, 15 seconds till ignition. Bring up this HG3. Very risky, it says. Risky. Very stable. Hold it, hold it, hold it. The ignition. Solid light on the HG3. Fantastic. And uh, we are off to the moon. Well, we're just going to speed through this, like, immensely. Because uh, it went extraordinarily well, I guess, is the point here. But... Uh, I did take the opportunity to refuel the lander from Artemis herself, or whatever it is that we're going to call it, proceed on out to the moon, get to orbit, and uh, get ourselves in a place to make our capture burn. So uh, here's old me. All right, RCS to arm. And uh, it looks like our overbuilding of this DN6 may be the savior of this mission entirely, as we can just uh, use our second ignition on this HD3 upper stage. It doesn't have enough quite to get us to as low an orbit as we want, but it certainly does have enough to capture us. And that takes a huge burden off the Artemis. Uh, as far as what we would need the fuel from our primary tank to do, which uh, we still have a whole lot in here, and we've of course got this tank down here, which we can get home just on this tank. We're at I mean, not even full, but we're certainly going to top it off and lock it before uh, we do a whole lot else. I'm glad that I didn't just go ahead and try to do this, because I did not realize that tank was not locked. And we would have spent probably the lion's share of our Delta V, because uh, that figure does not account for towing around the lander. So we actually probably have about a third of that in braking. All right, it'll take one minute to displace all 771 meters per second left in this HG3 stage. Which, if we could get loosely on the node, that'd be great. Let's just go ahead and speed through about another two minutes here. All right, 38 seconds till. Let's go ahead and ullage this engine. Oh, already very stable. All right, ignition. Please light, please light. Yes. That's a solid light on our HG3. Fantastic. Uh, we are in business, and we got about 120 liters of each fuel here. We can go ahead and uh, remove those. B upper stage won't need them. And there's orbital insertion at the moon. That's fantastic. <laughs> There's hope for this mission yet, despite my blundering. All right, there's flame out. Yeah, about 54 or so meters per second left to go. Uh, we are actually going to uh, go ahead and get around to the top side of our orbit, or at least in the daylight, before we do this whole rendezvous docking thing. And then we're going to try to push the upper stage uh, into the moon so that we don't have just uh, more useless debris floating around out here. All right. Hopefully, uh, what's our time to Apogee? 25 minutes. 
Let's see if we can do this in less than 25 minutes. I can already hear the keys clacking, telling me about a mod that I obviously need to install. Well, don't you worry, I'm not gonna. So uh, the docking took uh, about 16, 18 minutes or so. Um, thruster placement needs another pass on this thing. Obviously, it's just those uh, fairing bits make that a little difficult, but uh, I don't think it's anything we can't solve. So um, we're just not going to worry about it too much, and it's definitely going to get another pass sometime very soon. But I did, in fact, eventually get it right after <laughs> two or three attempts. Anyway, uh, here's old me. Whew. All right. Finally. <laughs> All right, and we'll just do a uh, control from here. And uh, try to point this thing to retrograde. I mean, at some point, eventually, perhaps. Are these thrusters not firing? That's interesting. All right, but we also, uh, yeah. Uh, let's disable the RCS on the command pod. We probably used all of that. Why the hell aren't these aren't these ports firing? These ports should definitely be firing. Extend panels. <laughs> Cannot deploy while stowed. That's cool. No big deal. All right, we are close enough to our apoapsis. We're going to go ahead and... Uh, why the hell aren't these ports firing? This bothers me very greatly. All right, shut down. Decouple. And now none of our thrusters ports are firing. No nearby objects to focus. Oh, well, that's interesting. Tell me there's a decoupler down here. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, we have to do something about this, like, right now. Oh, good. Very, very good. Jettison this panel. EVA, our engineer. Um, what are you, what are you doing? Okay. Why are you spinning? I have no control here. I am I am not touching the throttle. I am not doing nothing. Oh boy. And she's just going to burn through all, all of her fuel. What the hell is going on here? Stop. Why are you doing this? Why can't I just drop this thing? You've got to be...
Just get back to Artemis, please. I do not understand this at all. Got no mech jet window. God, what the bloody hell is going on? Oh. My only conclusion was that it's probably that uh, extra surface mount that she's carrying that is just throwing her weight off so much it's causing the RCS to go crazy, which uh, was fixed momentarily by going into time warp and just letting her float away, but her fuel is... Uh, very, very, very low. So it was turn the jetpack on, make a small adjustment before it could go crazy, and then turn it right back off again. As you can see there, her fuel tank is down to like the point one something. Bump. Throwing orbital darts when your darts are astronauts. Uh, it was not the most accurate throw, but thanks to her uh, retained inertia, it was enough for her to roll close enough to the hatch to grab onto the handrail, which will happen here eventually, I assure you, or she'll go tumbling off into space, and I don't know if we would be able to rescue her. But yes, see, she was able to grab the handrail. Uh, the capsule, however, is full, and while she does have a little fuel left, I didn't want to chance it. I Instead, we're going to get rid of this ridiculous concrete block thing that is causing so much trouble because uh, she has a job to do and we need to do it before we go piling into the surface with the rest of our um, supposed to be deorbited B upper stage. So we'll just uh, climb down the ladder a little bit. Uh, I know I could have just attached it where I had it previously near the coupling ring and uh, like not actually attached it, just placed it. But when it goes blue like that, I worry that it's going to default to place. I wanted it to be green, like this, so that uh, as soon as KSB catches up with everything that's going on... Yep, there it goes. Bump. And uh, that's a nice concrete block weight off of our RCS system, which now should behave quite properly. Uh, however, we should probably step inside to refuel it. Lucky for us, we can board from that ladder section. Hallelujah. So, she will top off her RCS pack, grab her trusty DeWalt cordless drill, and uh, get to separating this B upper stage from the rest of our spacecraft because somebody somewhere forgot to put in a very necessary decoupler. Now, unfortunately, I can't just detach the ring itself. It keeps telling me too far, no matter how close to it I am, even very close here to the center, which left really just one option. Detach the the Astris engine on which it was attached, which takes our engine count from five to four. And for half a second there, I considered chasing after the stage, detaching the engine, carrying it back, and then reattaching it. These engines are quite recessed, however, and that plan would probably not work out exactly the way we wanted it to. But with all the dead weight finally gone and all the astronauts safely back inside the vehicle at some point or another, we will turn this thing to prograde and uh, relight our service propulsion system to bring our periapsis to something that uh, isn't danger close <laughs> at, at all, really. And uh, we will then make an adjustment on the other side of our orbit to uh, bring us a little more circular. We can also deploy these landing legs and hope that they don't uh, freak out on us or start causing a lot of undue problems. And now it's time to start prepping this lander for landing. Yes, which means we need to get these two crates off the Artemis, onto the back of our trusty cosmonaut, astronaut, Kerbal knot, Kerbal knot. That's what we're going to go with, Kerbal knot. And uh, attached to the mounting points down here on the bottom of the lander. Now they are carrying exactly identical cargoes. So there's absolutely no reason why this should throw off our weight balance or cause anything absolutely screwy or crackeny to happen, but I'm calling it now. Something screwy or crackeny is going to happen, seeing as how this mission has been particularly blessed 
so far in all the which ways that it could possibly have gone. And here we are in a nice orbit of the moon, treated to a very nice Earth rise. That's going to do it for this one, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see all of you in the next one. So until then, see you later.